Let, let me uh, make a short summary. This uh, has a bachelor in history of engineering and masters on uh, material science and uh, uh, the fact it is TV was already in Spain, computational and biomechanics in the UP, University Polytechnic in Naples. He has been uh, as a postdoctoral student uh, in uh, Davos and uh, uh, I Domen in Canada. He came back in, to, to Barcelona in 2009 to the where he has been uh, doing this kind of research in, uh, in many different European projects. Until 2015, that he moved to the, to the University of Pompeo Fabra, and he had his uh, group in multi scale computational uh, mechanics and mechanical biology. And I'm uh, not going to go into any details, but there have been many different uh, European, European, European projects around this area. Yes, obviously, very relevant at least of publications. It is an important member of the European Society of Mechanics and the Victor Physiological Institute of History. Fantastic. So, so thank you very much, Alfonso, for the introduction. So thank you very much for the for the invitation. Um, and thank you very much then for taking the time then to be here. And I look forward uh, then to further discuss. Um, so I hope that you can hear me well in the in the bottom. The voice will tell me, and I, I try to force a little bit the voice. Um, and I think the sound online is okay because I'm close to the mic. Um, so before I start, uh, I wanted to actually give you a bit of overview uh, of the ecosystem in which I'm professionally evol evolving. So as Alfonso said, I'm at, at UPF um, and the School of Engineering, formerly Department of Information and, and Communication uh, Technologies. Uh, and I'm involved in the biomedical uh, research unit. The biomedical research unit um, has most of its uh, activities also shared with uh, the Department of uh, um, Life Science and, and Medicine at Hospital Del Mar. So many projects that we have uh, are actually done between engineering and, uh, and medicine. Um, so we're about uh, 300 people in the department. Out of these 300 people, we have about 100 persons uh, in, the, in biomedical engineering. And uh, out of these 100 persons, so we have about uh, 40 people in the group that's called Symbiosis, Simulation, Imaging, and Modeling for Biomedical Systems. And we are uh, three co-directors, uh, Miguel Angel Gonzalez Ballester, Gemma Pieya, and myself. So uh, Miguel Angel is uh, in charge of computer-assisted uh, surgery. Gemma is in charge of patient diagnosis, so mostly based on uh, uh, medical images and stratification, so using machine learning, artificial intelligence. And then myself, as uh, Alfonso introduced, so I'm in charge of biomechanics and mechanobiology. We all work on computer um, models and simulations. So combining machine learning, data science, image analysis and processing, and physics-based biology, uh, physics and biology-based models and simulation. So myself, I am in the physics and biology-based model and simulation. You won't see much uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, in my presentation. Um, much not to say, almost not at all. Um, so, and here we go then to the science. Uh, I'll make a brief introduction about uh, non-communicable uh, disease and, and, and disorders. Uh, from now on, I will call uh, non-communicable disease and disorders NCD, this sh uh, shorter. And um, so you may know that in the last decades, so the burden of infectious disease has uh, decreased a lot uh, since the progress in medicine to uh, life uh, Hygiene, uh, but this is not the case for the NCDs. And if we if we look uh, at the evolution then of the burden between um, 1990 and 2090, we see that uh, there is a change in the in the color maps all over the world. 
So the maps are becoming uh, less reddish or less uh, yellowish, which means that basically well, we have a huge uh, increase of the burden of, burden of these NCDs. So uh, how can I go up here? Right, thanks. So there is definitely something um, that we're not uh, doing very correctly. If we look at the Global Burden Disease Study of 2019, so pre-COVID, uh, we see that among the top 10 most disabling and life-threatening disease and disorders, so these NCD um, stand uh, for 70% uh, uh, of the disease. So it comes it comes before uh, before cancer, and among these NCDs, so more than half are actually NCDs that affect mechanically loaded uh, organ and and tissues. Now, if we look at the post COVID uh, figure, so this is the latest uh, this is the latest uh, global burden disease study as it has been published, and we see that so in many places of the world actually then. Uh, COVID so represents then the highest burden suffered by uh, by the world. Uh, nevertheless, if we look at uh, Western uh, industrialized countries such as U.S., Western Europe, uh, or uh, Australia, you see that uh, low back pain uh, becomes uh, the most uh, the most disabling uh, disorder. Uh, and low back pain was actually ranking fourth in the in the former slide. So I will talk a bit about low back pain, and then I will switch about osteoarthritis, which is basically very very similar. So musculoskeletal, highly multifactorial. Um, so there is uh, there is a urge to cope with uh, with low, with low back pain, and low back pain doesn't affect uh, people. Uh, in the elderly obligatory. So, so how many of you in the room uh, have experienced low back pain? Okay, hands are rising. So more or less than half. The good news is that it's not become it's not because you're getting older. <laughs> the bad news is that uh, there are no solutions to low back pain, and and you, you might know it. So people have tried to use uh, artificial intelligence and uh, in this uh, systemic review, uh, which I liked, so the, the, they made the different challenges uh, very clear for artificial intelligence and machine learning. And they say explicitly that if artificial intelligence and machine learning so is to make an impact on low back pain management, it will likely need uh, to develop greater re reliability and validity compared to current approaches. And here are the challenges. So one of the challenges is identifying relevant subgroups among patients with low back pain to permit the discrimination of diagnosis categories that inform clinical decision making and treatments. Another challenge is that uh, all the algorithms and then models that are data driven so have to cope with uh, small data sets and even extremely heterogeneous data sets. So the end is not really here. And at the end, so they say, so to determine the utility of uh, artificial intelligence of machine learning, studies implementing uh, studies in low back pain need to examine a variety of known risk factors across multiple domains. So let's focus about uh, known risk factors and see what are the challenges and how then we can use, uh, so not machine learning, but physics-based and biology-based uh, modeling in order to see a little bit clearer. So, um, we, we already know that degenerative spine disease so are uh, the leading unique cause of low back pain uh, worldwide. And then among these degenerative spine diseases, so the intervertebral disc degeneration is highly prevalent so all over the world. Now, if we look down at the determinants of intervertebral disc degeneration, which can be done through uh, homozygote uh, twin studies, so we see that uh, in the upper spine, here, I will change the screen. So we see that in the in the upper lumbar spine, so here, so uh, most of the degeneration cases are explained actually by uh, genetic variants. So by what they call uh, familial aggregation. Now, 
If we go down then to the lower spine where mechanical loads are the highest and where the prevalence of the disorder is also the highest, we see that most of the cases become unexplained. And this is basically because there is probably an interaction between gen uh, genetic uh, causes, age, and physical loading. But as I said, uh, age per se is very low, physical loading per se is also very low. Uh, so that's still a paradigm that sticks to people working in low back pain, but physical load is very important. So basically what we might have is that there is uh, probably an interplay among biological and mechanical factors that leads then to complex and multifactorial uh, endotypes. Now, going down to the science that has been established for all mechanosensitive uh, tissues and, and organs, uh, in organs such as the intervertebral disc, this is also true uh, for the knee joint, this is also true for the arteries. So the way external mechanical loads are communicated uh, to the cells and then shape cell activity actually uh, goes through the superposition of uh, different phenomena, of physics, multiphysics phenomena, biological phenomena, and then at the crossroads of uh, physics and biological is mechanobiology. And mechanobiology per se, so is uh, can be split into uh, two totally different uh, phenomena. So one is indirect mechanotransduction, and then the other one is direct mechanotransduction. So what it is? Indirect mechanotransduction is linked to the multiphysics of the tissues. So we're talking mostly about soft tissues that have uh, at least eighty percent of water. When these tissues are deformed mechanically, so water is expelled or flows in. So basically the volume of water is constantly changing. If the volume of water is constantly changing, so we change then the percentage of volume through which biochemical factors can be transported, okay? Uh, which means that with the mechanical loads, we're chronically then altering so the, biomechanic, the biochemical environment uh, of the cells because we're altering them to transport of uh, the biochemical factors. And it's obviously uh, alters the biochemical signaling and then the cell activity. Uh, direct mechanotransduction is uh, more straightforward. These cells basically have mechanoreceptors on their membranes. And these mechanoreceptors so, are able then to sense the deformation of the extracellular matrix in different ways, either via direct uh, clumping or uh, via uh, protein bending. Uh, or even through uh, ion, ion chain. This is called indirect mechanotransduction. So here we see that, uh, so indirect mechanotransduction uh, that is linked to mechanical loads interact with direct mechanotransduction, which is also linked to mechanical loads, but through two different uh, pathways. And then they both superimpose uh, to the constitutive biology of the cells that is shaped uh, by the gene. So at the end of the day, uh, we have a highly complex system where it's very difficult to uh, identify what is the cause and what is the, what is the consequence. And is there a leading unique biological cause or multiple one? Is that constant through time? Is that uh, reproducible from patient to patient, et cetera? These are all uh, totally open uh, questions. So in order to dig uh, into this, uh, this complexity, so we used uh, physics and biology-based models. And here the objective is uh, to have a modeling pipelines that allow us then to travel back and forth between uh, the organ and tissue informations to uh, the biochemical and, and, and cellular uh, information. So on that, on, on the right side, to, um, on the organ and tissue sides, we have the phenotypes that are typically then observed uh, through medical, uh, medical images. And then on the right side, on the biological side, we have the endotypes. So which are the molecular cocktails that uh, can represent a fingerprint print of specific phenotypes, of one phenotype, of a group of phenotypes, with, we don't know. And then the objective to this kind of, of exercise is to not determine a biomarker that would be statistically present, but is to determine so sets of endotypes that would represent mechanisms, that would represent mechanisms that a long time can even explain then uh, shifts 
uh, among different endotypes, also for the prevention. So technically speaking, the way we are, the, the way the way we're doing that, so at the system uh, level, so we have uh, the multibody dynamics, which allow us then to extract mechanical uh, forces that we input on finite element models, through which we can predict uh, 3D tissue deformations and stress and mass transport uh, fields. Uh, then we can extract boundary conditions over representative uh, volumes, but we have uh, cell collections. We can represent those cell collections through agent-based uh, models. Where and access then to the collective cell behavior, and in order then to go down to the possible uh, individual cell behavior and uh, heterogeneity of uh, cell phenotypes uh, effects. So um, then we can use uh, network models uh, that would represent so the highly multifactorial uh, control of. Uh, individual agents and all the individual agents and collaborating together in order then to answer to the homogenized uh, fields. So technically speaking, uh, so basically, so all these pipelines then combines a system of ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, uh, deterministic solvers, uh, stochastic, uh, stochastic solvers, through, uh, through all the scales. So now uh, I will give you an example, a very concrete example on how we combine them to different things. So by coming back to the, to the intervertebral disc. So let's start at the organ and tissue level. So uh, we are here uh, using then finite element modeling. And in finite element modeling, what we can do is that we can play uh, with the constitutive equation, with the physics with the physics and biochemical theory. So we can put into math, uh, so multiphysics, such as osmotic pressurization, which largely controls the volumetric deformations and then the flow of water and then of uh, um, molecular mass transports uh, within, the, within, within the organ. And uh, we can integrate that then totally into the mechanics. So this is the stress tensor here. This is the osmotic potential. And this osmotic potential so can be made uh, explicitly dependent on the biochemical composition of the tissue. So here, protoglycans, collagen, and water, which has the main three, uh, which has the main three constituents. We run sensitivity analysis by varying the loose parameters, but other parameters that would be a bit more phenomenological. And then we verify that those parameters are actually then the largest determinants uh, of the volumetric deformations of the intervertebral disc which shape uh, most of the functional biomechanics. Um, then once we have then those, uh, those composition dependent mechanical descriptions, so uh, we can then further uh, link the volumetric deformations that we are predicting that depend on the composition uh, with the reactive transport of important, uh, important molecules. So here we're talking about the intervertebral disk, the intervertebral disc is relatively large. So we are at the uh, centimeter scale in terms of height, and it's totally avascular. So basically, then the nutrients need to travel through diffusion from the peripheral vasculature, so inside the disc, so that cells can uh, not only survive, but uh, have proper metabolism. So we focus then on the metabolic transport and simulated in the transport of oxygen, glucose, and lactate, so because we have glycolytic uh, cell respiration. And uh, we have our uh, diffusion coefficients and our gradient of concentration that's become so directly dependent on the volumetric deformations that depend on the composition of the tissue, so the phenotype of the tissue, uh, so to say. And uh, this controls, so the... Um, metabolic uh, reactions. So we validate, we always validate the model. So here on the right side, you have the validation of the finite elements model. And you see that there is grade, so grade three, grade two, grade four. So basically then the grade is the level of degeneration that depends on the composition. So we represent the degeneration with the composition and then we're able then to validate so different uh, grades of, of degeneration based on our hypothesis that composition leads the way of, of mechanics through the volumetric deformations. 
and we also validate uh, the the metabolic transport uh, of the um, uh, of oxygen glucose and lactate uh, through then the eventual validation of the resulting cell viability that uh, is directly controlled by this metabolic transport by simulating diffusion chamber experiments and then we can start we can start then the science we can start exploring things so one of the first things that we have explored we have explored clinically invisible tissues so one of the clinically invisible tissues we focused is called the cartilage end plate so cartilage end plate is basically a very thin, a very thin cartilage layer here between the intervertebral disc and the vertebra if you look on the MRI it's almost invisible. You see something that is black, okay? In this black uh, region on the MRI, so you can have cartilage, you can have bone, you can have a mix of everything. So it's very difficult to control basically what is happening here, especially when signal starts to be altered with degeneration. Um, nevertheless, what we know is that in relatively early uh, disc degeneration and highly painful, so you have on the MRI, you have a hyper signal. So here actually you see that hyper signal here. This is, this, this is inflammation. And we believe that this inflammation affects then this cartilage plate. If it affects this cartilage plate, it basically probably affects the composition of the cartilage plate because where you have inflammation, you have enzymes. And where you have enzymes, you have degradation of the matrix, okay? And this cartilage plate is actually a filter a natural filter that controls the flow of water in and out the disc when you deform the disc mechanically. So we basically have uh, collected composition, uh, composition data from the literature. We have developed permeability models that depends on the composition, calibrated it, validated it. And what we have seen is that, so if you have a functional composition, so here that would be the gradient composition in, in, in red, uh, if you have a functional composition, you're limiting a lot. So the fluid mass outflow from the center of the intervertebral disc, so here's the NP, then to the, ver to the vertebra, okay? So in other words, you have to keep your intervertebral disc hydrated if you have then uh, the gradient composition, uh, which would be the healthy functional one as measured. So here in this uh, young, uh, donor specimen. So then what happens? So now we have the capacity to simulate degeneration by playing with the composition. Okay, so this is what we do. Uh, so from the literature, biochemical measurements, we simulate uh, early, uh, we simulate early degeneration and we calculate uh, after mechanical loads or during mechanical loads, the water content within the center of the disc, this nucleus pulposus, so you see that you see here. And what we see is that when we only have this very thin layer of cartilage degenerated, we are losing as much water as if the entire intervertebral disc would be degenerated, which is grade three degeneration. Grade three degeneration is typically what happens. Uh, this is the most prevalent phenotype of the disc when you're between 45 and 50 years uh, of of age, okay? But this would already occur by 20 years of age. Um, and when we are losing, so this is a constant loss and this is a chronic loss, okay? Just to make the difference uh, because this is under the effect of mechanical loss. So chronically what happens when you lose that much water is that you have a spot of relatively high nutrient deprivation. So the concentration of glucose uh, fall from uh, 50 millimolar, which would be the boundary concentration to less than one millimolar in this region. Interestingly, this is in this region where you start to see, change screen, where you start, where you start to see the first signs of uh, deorganization in early degeneration of the intervertebral disc. A long time, this is also all the bluish region here, is also the region where you see most protomics changing uh, along, along aging. So the question is, so uh, is the local nutritional stress under mechanical load then a valid biological reason for early degeneration and aging? And this is what uh, we want to answer. So 
Before doing that, we also know that diffusion distances, so be, before going into the biology, we know that the diffusion distances depend uh, on the size of the organ, okay, on the D. Um, so we started then to go into patient-specific modeling of the intervertebrates. So out of MRI images, segmentation, mesh morphing processes, et cetera, we've developed so patient-specific intervertebral disc models. And we have annotated uh, the mid highs of the disc. So here in this example. And what we see is that in full intervertebral discs, okay, we have much more deprivation of glucose in this hot spot here uh, than in so medium intervertebral disc, okay? And curiously, people with very large intervertebral disc very often end up, radiologically speaking, with a black disc when they are around already their 20s. But of course, it's based on small data. So it's, it's just a guess, but it's, but then it indicates which kind of data you, you need them to collect in order to further collaborate with, uh, with large M. And uh, what is further interesting is that when you when you link here's the mouse uh, when you further uh, simulate when you further couple the morphology with a simulation of a grade one so a healthy intervertebral disc and a grade three intervertebral disc so uh, mildly degenerated intervertebral disc always by playing with the composition so we can see that. Uh, the reduction of, of glucose is much higher in the tall intervertebral disc, okay, that in the thin intervertebral disc as reflected by the uh, orange uh, by the orange bar, okay? So here we come to the conclusion that the, the morphology of the disc, the initial morphology of the disc is probably a risk factor, at least for accelerated degeneration, okay? And here, you're lucky or you're not, because you're born with what you're born. So that could be part of the uh, actually genetic determinants. So um, then in order to have the N I was mentioning, so in a European project, this for all, so in which uh, Jose Luis and then uh, Mariano uh, are participating. So we have a bunch of computer scientists uh, working on advanced annotation of, uh, of MRI and uh, then we gather so uh, all the annotations in order then to merge uh, all the information of the annotations with then the patient specific modeling pipelines, so as to be able to further do uh, so data mining with the predicted biophysical uh, results with with the phenotypes with proper ends. Uh, since we are doing this exercise, we have also then size the opportunity then to do open science, to share our models. So this is this was a, this is a collaborative columbar spine model, and we have also our intervertebral disc models. That's then thanks to this for all project. So you might Francis has been time so here uh, at at BSC. So we have developed so open access platform in order to. Um, uh, share all our models, uh, all properly annotated, etc., so that uh, the people can reuse that. Uh, if we want them to do a large number of simulations, uh, we have computation, uh, computational time issues. Uh, we cannot afford to have 20 hours of simulation for one intervertebral disk, which is what is happening with all the complex combinations of uh, constitutive equations, multiple phenomena, etc. So here at BSC, so Dimitri, so who was uh, then working with Bea here and uh, with Mariano here, um, so has then re-engineered so our intervertebral disc models in Alia, and then we could uh, reduce the computational time to uh, more than twenty hours to few to few minutes, and then working with Jose Luis, so we have also then Maria Paola that is working on integrating. So all the pipeline of image annotation, segmenting, and then simulations. So in order then to do automatically, so all the, all the work of data collection, homogeneous annotation, and to prepare the first step of, of mining. 
Uh, we have a student translating the modern and simulation technologies also in, in predictors in uh, orthopedic in orthopedic uh, mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, we're spin offing uh, then our uh, technology in simo spine and then Morteza, uh, who is uh, the, the technical developer, who has done his PhD thesis, so has just been recently finalist on the European Society of Biomechanics uh, Clinical Biomechanics Award. So no, uh, down to the cell. So down to the cell. So remember, so we have our uh, we have our intervertebral disc model where we can map thanks to the partial differential equations. So the the locations where we think we have biologically relevant nutrient uh, deprivation. Okay, and here uh, we uh, like to call that entering the matrix. So here we enter in the biology. We do that in a relatively simple way at the beginning. And uh, so we basically look at what is available in the literature in terms of cell culture experiments and mRNA expression. So not single cell, huh? so, so basic cell culture, uh, cell culture uh, experiments. And uh, we extract and do the experiments uh, for which Cell culture perturbations are glucose and pH that are predicted fields of our finite element models, and to what it relates. So, in terms of um, structural protein uh, regulation, so uh, protoglycans here, aggregant, collagen type 2, collagen type 1, proteases, and uh, pro inflammatory factors. So, these all networks that uh, we call parallel network. Uh, because we select parallel things, uh, we superimpose parallel things. So eventually then predicts the phenotype of the intervertebral disc cell. So whether our intervertebral disc cell is immunopositive in IL-1 beta, in TNF alpha, or both, which is convenient because these are things that you can directly measure, not in vivo, but at least in cadaveric uh, specimens. And then depending on the phenotype you have, so you will have uh, a specific uh, cell activity. So that's a bit of mass. I will not enter into the mass, but for each link that we have between the nodes, so we have a function with uh, activation and inhibition inhibition terms, and uh, we feed uh, forwardly each function with uh, experimental correlation functions that we directly uh, extract from false mRNA expression then in the cell cultures. So um, nice thing is that we can extract a lot of information already done uh, from, the liter from the literature and uh, calibrate directly the model parameters. So this is not reverse engineering. This is really forward engineering. And where we don't have uh, information, so we basically then generate our, uh, our own um, experiments uh, through collaborations. So what we see here uh, is that if we have, so we have our hotspot of glucose deprivation when this cartilagen plate is uh, early degenerated. And now our model is telling us what might happen, biologically speaking. So if the cell is normal, not much is happening. So we have then protoglycans that are uh, expressed, collagen type 2 is also expressed, no proteases. So basically the system so can still be biosynthetic and can be uh, biologically happy. Uh, the figure is changing as soon as the cell becomes uh, immuno, uh, immunopositive. So for example, with IL-1 beta, so we start to see an increase of MMP3 and with TNF alpha, so we have a shutdown of collagen type 2, mm -hmm. very important structural protein, and we have an overshoot uh, of, uh, we have an overshoot uh, of the proteases. So what does it tell us? It tells us that indirect mechanotransduction, which is a paradigm uh, basically sticking into the uh, intervertebral disc community since decades, as probably then the first step for degeneration. So here we see that indirect mechanotransduction so would stand for a risk, but only if the intervertebral disc cells are already immunopositive in terms of IL-1 beta and TNF alpha. And the inter intervertebral disc is an immunoprivileged organ. So it's not obligatorily easy that those cells become immunopositive. So what can happen? And then we pass then to the, to the next question. 
So the nice thing is that uh, in the same way we had an introduced uh, glucose and lactate as stimuli in our network, we can also uh, introduce the mechanical loads because we have also dynamic cell culture experiments available in the literature. So we follow exactly the same pipeline and then we introduce the load magnitude and then the load, uh, the load frequency. And we can further access to then the coupled uh, to the coupling of the mechanical mechanical loads. So now we have both indirect and direct mechanical transduction. And uh, we can then figure those daily physical activities that would be either positive, so for instance, intervertebral disc. So I will not enter into detail, but you can see happy faces, mildly uh, not happy, and clearly unhappy faces, okay? And this is all these results basically could be uh, corroborated corroborated with the existing uh, literature. So, um, and uh, thanks to this exercise, we can also see the time effects. So for example, jogging. Jogging, jogging was leading to unhappy uh, face, but we had simulated two hours of jogging. So if you're simulating actually one hour of jogging, so your protoglycans are high, and all your proteases are, are low. So basically, there would be a happy face. No? But when, after one and a half hours of continuous jogging, so basically the situation uh, would be reversed. And at two hours, so uh, the proteases so have overcome the biosynthetic activity of, uh, of the cell. It's very difficult to validate, but basically, uh, we could then explain the controversial uh, findings. Uh, in the literature, and especially it gives a clue of how data should be gathered and segmented. That, and this is this is very this is very important. So because by default people are not paying attention in that. So people are dedicating a lot of efforts in order to build massive cohorts, and basically so those details that would be relatively simple to gather are lacking. And then you cannot call back the patients to do that. So that's, it becomes very difficult. Um, as I said, the immunopositivity of the cell is cornerstone for the, for the, for the predictions. So this is what uh, we have uh, validated uh, through direct observations in intervertebral displacement. So then we can validate then our percentages of uh, IL-1 beta immunopositive cells and TNF immunopositive cells in both uh, non-degenerate and, and degenerate disc with an overall uh, quite uh, good uh, agreement. So, so with this uh, parallel network modeling technology, uh, we have clear assets. First, we have forward simulations, no reverse engineering. We don't have any solver. It's one single OD. So it's really great because you can put that in the finite element models and directly solve uh, the equation either at the nodes or as a, as a integration in the integration points. Problem, the, scalab the scalability, so depends 100% on the available experiments. And here you come into the problems with experimental models. In experimental models, you're not always controlling the cell states in your controls. And, and this is something that uh, we have seen, I will not present that, but we, we, have, explored, we have explored this. And you, you can very strongly misinterpret your data if you don't have a good characterization of the control cells. Oops, sorry. So what do we do? So we want to scale up. We want to scale up to better interpret our cell culture. We want to scale up so in order to enrich our capacity uh, to describe possible endotypes and actions. So here we go to uh, knowledge-driven uh, modeling. So knowledge driven modeling. So I'm sure that so um, at least a bunch of you are uh, familiar with this. So basically, we gather uh, we gather information from first from expert literature. So we end up with a with a small corpus. Uh, we map uh, the concepts that uh, interest us uh, in a graph. Uh, we establish the relationships, so activations or inhibitions, and then. So we can solve the model either through uh, Boolean rules or uh, through uh, physio uh, physio physiologic models. And then uh, we have the steady states. We do falsification tests 
uh, on the steady state. So we're not proving that the model is valid. We're proving upon node perturbations that the model is not wrong, which is a bit different. Uh, and when we don't pass a steady state, so we start to enrich and we enrich. So this time with non-expert literature because we think that we have exhausted all what we could find in the literature. So we go to much more uh, general concepts. And then, so we run again then different falsification tests uh, until uh, we find uh, so an acceptable, an acceptable corpus and an acceptable model. So basically an acceptable model is a model, uh, the steady state of which would be biosynthetic. So according to the knowledge of the healthy cell that we have. So basically that would be the fingerprint print of a biosynthetic happy intervertebral disc cell that doesn't contradict so the knowledge uh, from the literature, okay? So this steady state actually is not unique. Uh, so you have, you, you calculate basically different attractors over 100, 1000 simulations. So here in that very specific case, you don't see uh, the, you don't see the bars because uh, the, the, there was almost just one attractor. So basically the network was, was robust. Sometimes you have multiple states with different probabilities, 80% probability for one state, 10% uh, or 20% probability for another state, etc. So you need to play with you need to play with that. So the nice thing here is that so we start then to have access to the information of pre-inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, growth factors, the brain enzymes, chemokines, structural proteins, uh, and, and others that can be all uh, candidate biomarkers to enrich your phenotypes and then to understand what is happening. You can also play with the models. So we saw that uh, cell immunopositivity, so it can be a risk factors uh, or can make indirect mechanotransductions that is linked to the mechanical load a risk factor. So you can uh, make your model immunopositive for I1 beta for TNF alpha, and then see so what would what could be then the risk to strategies of the system. Okay. And then you can further validate that with so with dedicated experiments, which is what we've done. So here, for example, we see that uh, if we are immunopositive in terms of the TNF, which would be mostly related with uh, the, the acute uh, inflammation in first instance, we see that anti-inflammatory cytokines, IL-4, IL-10, so are relatively then effective uh, to partly destroy the cell, so in terms of uh, structural, structural proteins, and then partly, partly shutting down also uh, the proteases uh, that are here. Uh, if you have IL-1 beta, and this is nice thing of this kind of graph that remains relatively mechanistic. So for example, if you have a cell immunopositive with IL-1 beta, you see that in your graph in steady states, IL-4 and IL-10 are already high. So adding IL-4, IL-10 won't have any effect. And, and, and very interestingly, this is what we see in our controls when we stimulate cell cultures with IL-4 and IL-10, we don't see anything if we have already a degenerate cell as a control. And we have corroborated that with, with proteomics. But then you can explore those strategies. So here we see, for example, that using TGF-beta in that case, so uh, can help them to so partly rescue uh, the cell. So much more degrading the um, uh, proteases and so partly restoring the biosynthetic uh, activity. We can make the networks uh, mechanosensitive in the same way that we have mapped soluble proteins in the former example. We can also map uh, the mechanosensitive cell receptors. We can map the downstream uh, regulation pathways, and then we come up with other networks. So for example, this network is, bi is, is bistable. Uh, we have 80% of happy cell and 20% of high P cell. So we are happy with the 80% and with the 20%, then I will explain you later what we do. Um, so here we have cell receptors, degrading enzymes, intracellular effectors, soluble proteins, structural proteins, membrane mechanoreceptors, and transcription factors. So the very nice thing here is that with transcription factors, you can also have access to possible uh, pharmacological, uh, pharmacological targets. We can also make, uh, with this kind of models, we can also make stratification efforts because uh, we can uh, simulate uh, physiological uh, loading 
by activating specific mechanoreceptors, we can simulate uh, so uh, chronic inflammation or chronified inflammation so in, the, in the joints, which is here called uh, synovitis, or the effect of hyperphysiological loads. And we can see so which kind of stimulation has more or less effect on different groups of important proteins, so structural proteins, transcription factors, nociceptive factors, so related with pain, degrading enzymes, and so hypertrophy is when your cartilage starts to become bone. And once your cartilage has become bone, so the bone is scratching against bone and it becomes extremely painful and there's nothing you can, nothing more you can do to say. So you cut down and you do a total knee replacement. Um, so we can see, for example, here very quickly that uh, synovitis, so chronic inflammation, so totally leads away. So if you don't solve that, uh, it becomes then very difficult and to use, for example, physical therapy strategies in order to reverse the to, to reverse the problem. Okay, uh, pink is no effect, and then green is effect, and the greener is more the effect. Uh, you see that anti-inflammatory uh, treatments, so can nicely cope with nociceptive factors. If pain is not sensitized, that's important uh, to highlight. Uh, but in terms of structural protein, basically the positive effect is less strong than the negative effect of the, of the synovitis. Now, in terms of hypertrophy, you have a lot of difficulties to reverse with anti-inflammatory treatments. So basically the dramatic endpoint of the disease so will be very difficult to cope with but you might be able to delay because you have a strong negative effect of anti-inflammatory on degrading enzymes, okay? And then we corroborate that with, uh, with, clinical, uh, with clinical treatment uh, that use biologics. So uh, injection of autologous cytokine-enriched serums into the knee joints of, of patients. And we currently have a project on that. Um, and then, so with these networks, the nice thing that now we can scale up again. So I've been scaling down and now I can scale up again. And so uh, here, so we, we we can then develop finite element models where we have then our extracellular matrix to the GAN depend on the composition, etc. And we specifically then uh, represent the cell. We represent so a layer that translate the semi-quantitative information of the network into quantitative information of molecules that will be transported uh, in, the, in the tissue. And so uh, we integrate the um, half-life of the molecules, et cetera. And then we can see what is the paracrine communication among cells and what is the effective uh, effect of having then these network simulations. So on the collection of cell and then be able to relate that with the phenotype. So we don't have final results with that. The nice thing here is that we can also uh, explore the multi-stable effects because we're sure that you have multi-stability. In a healthy disc, you do have immunopositive cells. These are a minority, around 10%, but you do, you do have. So and I'm finishing here. Uh, so to conclude, uh, so the system mechanobiology uh, models and simulations, so they are allowing to realize the importance of minor with strategical tissue volumes for already targeted through image-based diagnosis, uh, to identify biological risks associated with interplays between indirect mechanotransduction and organ morphology, and mechanistically explore the impact of pro-inflammatory cell activity and possible rescue strategies in different mechanobiochemical contexts. And here, uh, so there is an example of how we are using that then in an attempt to stratify patients by coupling everything with clinical data. So mining all the predicted information together with real world information, and then uh, achieve mechanistic stratification of, of the patient. So this is a pilot study because the M is still relatively low, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice example then of our vision in terms of, uh, of exploitation. And there is a limitation that I have not uh, mentioned. So the, the, the limitation that we have when we are doing our knowledge-based, uh, uh, knowledge-driven models, network models, everything is still extremely manual. So we're exploring ways in order to try to systematize the modeling, to size the network. So in a more systematic way than just manual check, manual falsification tests, et cetera, that is extremely artisanal 
and it, it works up to a certain point. And uh, so just thinking then the funding source and the people of the group who are also then distributed over multiple scales. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I got a few small questions uh, on the part of uh, cellular modeling. So, sorry for my ignorance, but how many type of cells do uh, you have in the internal disk uh, and that take care of the housekeeping of the different compounds that you mentioned? It's a single cell type or you have different cell types? Because you show a single model of cell mm -hmm. and it meets different products. Yeah. And I, as usual in science, the answer is yes and no. Um, so yes, because it's intervertebral disc cell and it's nucleus pulposus cell. So it's a disc cell that is resident in one single tissue. But this cell can acquire uh, different phenotypes depending on the immunopositivity. And you've seen that in the knowledge-based uh, knowledge, uh, network models, uh, the baseline activity of an immunopositive cell is very different from the baseline activity of a normal cell. So we tend, so we like to consider these cells uh, to have different phenotypes because we assume that these phenotypes uh, can be stabilized a long time. So if you're in a degenerated state, so the, the immunopositive uh, phenotypes becomes predominant and become stable. We don't have any new cells around it's just a single cell type. In the intervertebral disc, no, because there are no immune cells. Mm -hmm. So now we have another project where we're starting to couple what happens at the frontier with the vertebra mm -hmm. in interaction with innate, uh, innate immunology. So monocytes change into macrophages, differentiation between M2 and M1, and also um, neutrophiles that are so very important ones. But uh, I don't have results to show. Okay. Your question regarding so this, um, this means the memory loss of something. So the disk is closed and there are only conjugal sites in the disk. And then the interaction is with the with the vertebrates and with yeah. the other cell types. Exactly. So it's a closed system. It's a closed system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's very, very punctually done connected with uh, uh, bone marrow contact. Uh, channels with the microvascular buds, and then from these microvascular buds, things diffuse in. So we assume that when you have endothelial dysfunction, this cartilagen plate, which is this invisible tissue, actually you can have a leakage of the endothelial layer under specific circumstances that would make monocytes and neutrophiles penetrate into the tissue, where they would very locally then start to accelerate degradation processes. And, and now we're now we're in the way then to simulate to, to, to build the models okay. that correspond to that. And regarding the cellular model, it's, uh, how you find out that those were the factors. So it's a uh, knowledge base to say okay glucose and then the connections they are where this information gets so it is yeah curious. so we have the two models huh? we have the parallel network so parallel network is not knowledge based is data driven. So, so, we need to define which so why you're focused on glucose and not uh, glycine, which is also a critical amino acid for you know what I mean. So you, you select a couple of uh, entities in your model. Yeah, because because then we have this stratification of, of mechanobiology into indirect and direct. Okay. And then indirect for the intervertebral disc, so as mostly related so with glycolysis. And then you construct more based on those questions. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you need a prior knowledge. So you need to make sure that this prior knowledge is robust enough not to waste months and months of developments. And and uh, but we need to use this prior knowledge, yes. And then if you have supporting data, so basically you know that your prior knowledge is relatively robust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for a great talk. Uh, um, I was just wondering, uh, maybe it's a little bit off topic, but why is the incidence higher now than 20, 30 years ago? Is there any data showing why that might be? So we could 
I don't know, prevent it somehow? Mm -hmm. So I think there, this is, this is my personal guess, huh? yeah. I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, but I, I think there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that knows there is better diagnosis. I mean, probably 20 years ago, or uh, when my parents uh, had my age, uh, you know, you were complaining about back then, say, yeah, you're growing old. And this is the explanation. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, will you, will you get a surgery or not? <laughs> so basically, the, 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 everything would be extremely binary. And then the explanation is that you're, gr you're growing old. So no, uh, but it's relatively recent. Huh? It's only maybe in the last two decades. So thanks to very large population courts, so and to these homozygote uh, twin studies, we start to seeing that this is not true. It's not linked. It's not linked to his age, because you you already have a strong prevalence uh, between 25, 49 years uh, years of age. So basically. It has unlocked so an entire field of research, and people still don't really know what is happening. So this is why we're developing all what we are developing. Yeah. So I think I think we're only at the very, 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 very beginning of everything. So for example, you look at the experimental bio biological models on intervertebral disease cells or on uh, knee joint uh, articular chondrocytes. So these models are extremely very basic compared to what you might find in the cancer field where you have all these microfluidics, this organ on a chip, uh, all these single cell uh, rna -seq analysis, et cetera. And, um, but it's progressing, it's progressing. But it is true that even the experimental models have started relatively late to be, to be well-developed. And uh, so in terms of biological knowledge, and actually we're struggling with that, we have very difficulties to find good corpuses. Right. And, and the, the enrichment is a cornerstone in our case. So this is why I was mentioning, you know, having the ability to semi-automatize semi things and assessments of stability, network stability, network robustness, etc. is very important for us. And we are starting to look into that um, because of this. Um, and then uh, in terms of clinics, uh, I think it's it's even the situation is even worse. Um, when you talk to neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and, and rheumatologists, which are then uh, the, the three uh, medical uh, fields that cope with uh, with these disorders, they are relatively far away and to consider biological endotypes. So there are very few groups that know are working uh, with um, immuno, uh, so antibody strategies, et cetera, than to analyze body fluids, most in the knee joint, not in the, not in the spine, in order then to find out biomarkers. So there is now Corunia, there is, a, there is a group that has a cohort of a few hundred patients who was doing that, but they are still struggling with the longitudinal data. They still, they still don't know the course. So they have identified biomarkers, and out of these biomarkers, almost 100% fail actually to make their way to the therapy. So in that sense, it's still very, it's still very incipient, and it's, it's still part of the clinical research. And, and, and I think the clinical practice might still need between 10 and 20 years to arrive there. Maybe less, and that's my personal guess. But, yeah. From the clinical point of view, what would be the next phase of what are the next data set or the next model that we do on the Yeah. So in, in terms of clinical impact, so I was mentioning the biology and how slow are things because it's so complicated. Uh, nevertheless, in terms of uh, image 
phenotyping and image-based stratification, things are progressing much faster. And then thanks to machine learning and then to artificial intelligence. So um, I think that the first impact that we are even starting to make because our preliminary results, so are very nicely corroborated, uh, is then this mining between the multiphysics finite element predictions uh, with, uh, with the phenotypes. So for example, I was mentioning this European project is this for all. So this, this is probably where, where we will have our strongest impact. And, uh, and somehow medical doctors feel much more comfortable also with, with this kind of uh, transfer of knowledge from research uh, to the clinics because they feel the control much more. Because if you talk to them about biology, they're totally overwhelmed because they start to think about the immune system, about the low-grade inflammation, about... So, so it's much more difficult. But images, Im images is, uh, is probably the next step. Still limited because it's punctual and you act once uh, patients have already their symptoms. Yeah. So prevention is not there. But if at least we can improve in terms of stratification, uh, we can, for example, lower the uh, rate of, of surgeries. Because we can say, no, your phenotype is not, is objectively speaking, not a phenotype uh, for which a surgery will have a beneficial uh, impact. So if you have chronic pain, you might first go several months into pain clinics and let's have your pain thoroughly diagnosed in terms of sensitization, et cetera, et cetera. And then we reevaluate. So I think this is the most immediate impact. And in terms of animal models, it's just, it's really good for any of the parts the Yes, so there are animal models uh, there are uh, mice macaque models models uh, for, the, for the biology. Uh, for the mechanobiology, there are uh, sheep and, and bovine models, which are the large animal models. Um, nevertheless, those models, for example, in the intervertebral list, uh, are difficult to interpret because the mice has a very different, so has a very accelerated metabolism compared to human. And the development of the disorder is extremely linked to the strong inertia, which you don't really find in, in mice. So in mice, you might, you might measure a lot of things and you say, wow, I have found the biomarker, I have found the treatment. And when you pass through the large animal and it fails, because basically you are biased with all the very uh, short time fluctuation in the mice that have the most no relevance in the large animal. So that, that's the problem with the mice model. Nevertheless, it helps to understand the basic biology, yes. And uh, large animal models uh, have the limitation that they cannot properly reflect the indirect mechanotransduction phenomenon because they are quadrupeds, because the size of the disks uh, is very different from the human one. So the bovine one would be the most alike one. And uh, and so not all the animals uh, develop spontaneous intervertebral disc degeneration. So you need to create a disc degeneration animal model. So you induce degeneration, and you hope that the way you induce degeneration would be alike the emergence of degeneration in a human. So, yeah, but uh, but then again, uh, it's 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 progressing, and uh, and for example. Just saying that, sorry. Uh, there are techniques of injection of um, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, so pluripotent cells mm -hmm. in the intervertebral disc. It all started with our large animals, bioreactor studies, organ culture, then large animals. And now uh, there is a large European project that is called Respine. So, in which here the investment of Technon is involved, whereas they have a clinical trial on this. So, they have mildly positive results, but some patients benefit from that. Maybe one more question. Metabolism, I would presume, would be important here, but I haven't seen, maybe I missed it. 
Is there metabolic data that we could integrate in some model? Yeah. So, uh, for example, we're we're putting a lot of hope in uh, in single cell uh, RNA seq, and in order to have access to all the bioenergetics uh, to all the bioenergetics information and how it couples, so with uh, reactive oxygen, reactive nitrogen spaces, and then interacts with the rest of the regulation pathways because we know it interacts with uh, direct mechanotransduction. And um, so that's we're basically writing a grant <laughs> about this, but yes, definitely yes. Uh, there is not much for those cells. No, in bioenergetics. So you find a lot in, card in cardiomyocytes. Uh, you find a lot again than in cancer because in the tumors, and you know that uh, the level of oxygen are different in CD4, etc. But for those cells, it's data are coming. Data are coming, and people are looking into that. But it's it's yet on the rise. Okay. Thank you.